Okay, shall we make a start? So, what I want to talk about today is some ideas to do with software testing. So, to talk about some general ideas and discuss some general points, and then to talk specifically about this, this JUnit uh, system and, and give us a few details of how that works. So, thinking about how do we, what do we do when we're testing software, well, what are we doing? Well, we're doing something that's involving observing some aspects of behavior of a program when it's run with some test data or some set of behaviors, some set of interaction behaviors when a, a person def uh, in some usually fairly well-defined way interacts with the, the program. And specifically, testing is designed to uncover faults in the system. So, we're not able to prove that a system works, that a program does what it is designed to do by, by testing, um, but we can increase our confidence that it works by testing. But one of the problems with testing programs is that as systems get more and more complex, um, and indeed as they get beyond even a superficial level of complexity, uh, only a, a sample of the behavior can be tested. So, particularly when you get into the idea of software being implemented in different environments, and when you start to think about those levels of complexity, it's, it becomes impossible to uh, even do a fair sampling of, 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 of that in a way. So there's a, there's a lot of issues to do with how we design tests and how we choose test data and so on. And I've got a few slides about that, but before we do that, um, I thought it might be useful to see where we were at as a group. So we've all got some programming expertise, otherwise we wouldn't be in this room, you'd be doing another, another course. So I thought I'd do, would do this to start with, which is if you could spend about five minutes or perhaps a little less talking about these questions. What testing strategies have you either used or come across when you've been doing um, software development? In particular, I don't necessarily want this to be a, a repeat of things that you've been told you should do. I'm also quite interested in what you actually do, which may be different, um, and what's worked well and what hasn't worked. So if you could discuss that in little groups, perhaps two or three, you know, groups of two or three, for about five minutes, and then we'll, we'll share some of these ideas. Okay? Yeah, I don't know. 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 I don't know.
Okay, so so what things have people been talking about? What what ideas have you had? Expectations. So uh, the program should perform in a certain way. So we use uh, testing and have worries about what we should be getting out of it. Okay, that seems reasonable. Where do those expectations come from? How do you how do you how do you know what to expect? This is the requirements. So you've got some link with requirements. Mm -hmm. So. Think about these processes for software development. You've got some notion of eliciting and refining requirements, and that gives us some kind of set of things that we might expect the program to do. So there's a tie in there with uh, the requirements that we've identified. What other ideas are there around in testing? So there's, there's ideas of printing and um, and looking at things as you as you go through and trying to see whether they make sense. And so sometimes we're just sometimes we're doing stuff that's very informal, yeah. And sometimes that can be valuable. You're just printing values and seeing if they kind of make sense, seeing if you're getting. Um, yeah, you're getting data that looks like the kind of data you're expecting to get. You know, some of the things that I've found in programming, you know, you print out variables expecting to see some pattern in it, and you just get a list of zeros or something, you realize that a particular variable's not even been set or something like that. So this is, this is the sort of stuff that gets a bit of bad press in textbooks, you know, it's all high level stuff, but this is kind of, you know, this is kind of real programming, you know, this is, there's sort of, I think there's a role for this kind of much more informal stuff, uh, as well as the kind of very formal things as well, so people use these different things. I mean, someone, one of the students was doing a project a few years ago about debugging and finding problems in software and did a survey of staff and students in computing. And it was actually surprising how many people, you know, just used very informal methods. And I think there's a kind of guilt around that. We feel we ought to be familiar with all these tools, these sort of testing tools and debuggers and things like this. And actually, for certain situations, Printing values, doing that kind of basic sanity checking is a very valuable part of the process. What other kinds of ideas are there? Black box testing. Black box testing, what's that? Um, basically, you test the input and output and looking yeah. at the result. 
also white box test. Okay, so that's input and output. <coughs> so there, I mean that, I suppose, ties very much in with this idea, this black box testing ties very much in with this idea of requirements. Yeah, you've got specific things you want to, you want to see that they work. And you're more concerned there with confirming that they do work. And you contrasted that with white box testing, something which, which is a slightly strange name. The English language is very bizarre about the notion of white. White sometimes means opaque and coloured, but white also means transparent in some contexts. And in this context, it means you can see through it, yeah? So it means you're looking inside, inside the box, inside the program, and you're saying, you're using your, you're using a different kind of expectations here. You're not using expectations about requirements, about, uh, about what you expect the program to do. You're also, uh, using expectations about algorithms and things like that, yeah? So how does a particular algorithm work? So you're thinking about how the program does it, yeah? And so you've got this notion of, of white box testing, which is concerned with looking at the details of what's going on. So particularly, we might want to distinguish between something whose role is primarily to give us evidence that the program's working well, but then this kind of testing is about providing the kind of information that we need when we're trying to correct faults, yeah? So there's a kind of, I mean, this is always a big, division in computer science is one of the highest level ways of thinking about computing is this difference between what do we want the machine to do and how do we get it to do it and these distinctions permeate the subject and that's a, a good example of where, where that comes through. Any other ideas? Any other things you've come across? Sorry, just two uh, people. But where are they? Yeah, go on. Yeah, so different levels of detail and so on. So that ties in again with that's a sort of another aspect of this. How much do you need to test? You know, is it sufficient at first just to do some big tests and then when you're trying to discover something about a specific problem to go mm -hmm. down and understand more detail and and you also talk, talked about interaction with other other components, yeah, and testing how things work together. There's a comment from over here somewhere. Things like test driven development. Test driven development, okay. So we've got that, that idea. So this is very much, yeah, something where you say testing is, 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 is important, so we should do it. We should know what, what our program is going to do before we do it, yeah? So and one way to formalize that is to write tests before we even write any code to actually do the task at hand. So that's an interesting concept and seems to be quite a, a, a thing that's, that's, uh, that's, that's becoming, it's becoming quite, quite a dominant paradigm for software development. Um, and sp particularly in larger projects where things are being broken up between multiple programmers, multiple developers, you've got the idea of how do you communicate what a, what a requirement is, what's a, what's a piece of functionality. And test-driven development gives us very much a way of 
specifying that not just in a in a natural language description, but in a in a description that's formal and can be tested and, and confirmed whether it's whether that particular piece of the, the code is working or not. So there's a, a number of ideas there. Any other ideas? Yeah. Could you could you do that with the question? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, we we nowadays uh, like software interface a lot. Yes. So we have to do some kind of automatic uh, testing to make okay. sure each time when we test some program. So automatic some testing. Yeah. yeah. So that ties in quite closely with this. Yeah. If testing. If testing is a hugely complex process that takes a lot of effort to do and uh, is a very separate process, then that means that things like test-driven development are very difficult. Whereas if, if testing is automatic, if it's something you can write tests and run them all the time, then that makes things like test-driven development a lot, a lot more practical. So that's, a, that's another, another nice point. And in, in particular, something I'll talk about but later on, <coughs> which is linking this in with ideas of development environment, you know, IDEs and so on. The idea that testing isn't a separate process, it's something that's there in your environment. Some One of the writers about this who wrote the extreme programming book, was it Ford Cunningham or something like that, said, you know, there's this idea of a big red button, you know, rather than rather than testing being something really complex that you do, you set it up and then you have a button that you just press, and every time you make a change to your code, you press that button and see whether all the tests are, are satisfied, and that's you know, that sort of integrates testing into the, into the normal day-to-day change-by-change behavior of software development. So we've got a, a number of ideas there. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah? So, so you've got ideas of stepping. So stepping and breakpoints and things like that. So you've got this kind of you've got this kind of hierarchy of formality from things that are very very automated through things like this, which allow us to work interactively with code in perhaps a slightly more formal way to these very informal things. And different things are important at different times. You know, there's nothing I, like I say. You know, I think we need to be very open-minded and recognise that all of these different aspects have got different uh, different things to contribute. Is there another point over here somewhere? Yeah. Regression testing. Regression testing. So what does that mean? Um, after introducing new features or new questions, um, running all tests to make sure um, previous functions. Yeah. So you always, so rather than testing the thing that you've just done, you're testing everything, you're testing everything that, that everything still works as well. So that ties in very much with this automated testing idea and test room development. You know, you've got a, a set of tests that you can just run whenever you make a change. So you don't have to, you know, you don't have to choose to do testing as, a, as, a, as an independent activity. It's very much a kind of day-to-day -day activity. So that's a good set of ideas. I mean, I think we've captured most of the things that I was, I was thinking about. So, you know, there's different... Let's just go through these slides a bit, which I've got a lot of that sort of thing. So one distinction that some people make is between component testing and system testing. You know, you're, uh, the idea of component testing, which is this this day-to-day -day testing that we're talking about, with testing individual program components, which in this object-oriented kind of world are presumably methods and 
ways in which classes interact and those sorts of things. And <coughs> usually in, in practice, this is something that's being done by the, the developer of those components, the person who's writing the code. And, and, and that comes from perhaps your experience and your immediate expectations about that. But then there's another set of, of ideas to do with testing, which perhaps we didn't talk about so much here. This is very much to do with what people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But perhaps, well, I suppose perhaps this stuff to do with requirements and black box, black box testing also comes into this, which is this idea of system testing. The idea that whilst in theory, if you write all these components separately and have well-defined interfaces and all that stuff that I'm sure you've learned in, in, in courses, then of course it's all going to work and it's all going to fit together and there's not going to be a problem. But in practice, it's when you start to integrate things together that you realise inconsistencies in those specifications and things that have been badly done at that level of interfaces and interfaces between components and so on. And so there's ideas of system testing, testing groups of components. Sometimes, you know, in large projects, that's what's done separately from day-to-day -day development. You know, someone who's specifically working as a, a tester might focus on that. And that's, again, coming back to the system specification, saying, in this use case, in this requirement, there's a specific piece of behavior that we want to see. Can we see it happening? So that's one distinction. And I suppose another distinction, which is, is somewhat aligned with that, is to think about testing in terms of what's it achieving. And some people have drawn this distinction between validation testing and defect testing. So the difference between validation testing, trying to increase your confidence that the system meets its requirements. So we talked about requirements and expectations and all this sort of language here. So if we do testing and it's successful, then we can increase our confidence that the system will meet those requirements. And then there's a second kind of testing activity, a second point to doing testing. The actual things you do might be the same, but the other is to, to discover the faults and in particular trying to show that things are, that, that trying to make the thing not work, work badly. So that's probably, the, while the tools might be the same, the intention is very different. In one you're saying, here's what I expect a user to do. Here's what I expect to get from another part of the system. Questions like that. So you're saying, here's normal behavior. Does the system work as expected? This is completely the opposite. Here you're saying, what happens if you do something unusual? What happens if I don't get the input I'm expecting? What happens if a connection is dropped? What happens if someone tries to break the security of a system? There's a whole lot of stuff to do with um, to do with um, to do with that kind of uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, these tools can be used with different goals, and techniques can be used with different goals in mind. So. Um, you know, there's, there are various outlines of these kinds of processes. You know, here's one idea. Very simplistically, you know, you've got uh, the idea of test cases coming out of expectations and requirements, and those are used to prepare detailed data. We tend to have this in mean, testing. If you read textbooks on this kind of thing, they tend to be very much sort of 
about data, I think there's also a huge interesting area about testing interactive systems, testing user interfaces and stuff, which is perhaps less about data as such and more about, about behaviours, but you know, we can just substitute that in the same process and then running the programme on that data and comparing the results to expectations. <coughs> so part of a test case is what people do with the system, what inputs you get, what interactions you get, but another part is what you expect to get back from the system as a result of that. So you've got a, a kind of process there for, for running tests. So I think we, we've, we've talked about this already a bit, saying that you know, only if we could exhaustively test all the possible input data could we show that a program is free from defects. But of course, for any sensible scale of system, that's, that's impossible. So we have to sample. And sampling is a very interesting question. You know, how, how do you sample fairly from input data? Do you, generate, do you generate data at random? Well, that might be reasonable. But then, if you think about what we said about defect testing, sometimes you come across a situation where it's a very specific thing that causes a problem. So if you think about numerical data, the value zero, which is just one of many billions of numbers that are available. That's a very special value because you know, if you divide by zero, that gives you a, a specific fault that you don't get with any other with any other number. If you multiply some result by zero at some point, then perhaps that becomes uh, you know you've lost all your information. So there are specific pieces of data that can be can be gained that can be gain specific pieces of information. So just putting in random data isn't always right. So there's a whole there's a whole sort of set of practices in research literature about choosing test data and whether you choose the test data based on requirements or whether you choose test data based on coverage of code and you know and, and, and how that ties in with what you're trying to show and so on. So there's a huge amount of stuff there. And particularly, you know, there's this, this idea of, you know, testing policies, you know, how do you, at a slightly higher level, decide what to test? You know, all functions accessed through menus should be tested. Combinations of functions accessed through the same menu should be tested. These are just some examples of the sort of things you might get in a, a testing policy for some complex system. So, we've talked about these ideas up here, haven't we? So we've talked about the idea of, of, of black box testing, checking the input-output behaviour of some system or a sequence of interactions with some system works as expected. So, you know, confirming that the system works in line with some kind of some kind of requirements, some kind of notion of, of what happens. And then white box testing, observing the details of how that data is processed within an individual pro within an individual part of a program function or something. And so, you know, we, we, we might we might use this for kind of showing that we're confident about the system working, but then when we have a problem we probably want to look in a bit more detail and see exactly where things are going wrong. And then we talk about test-driven development, and um, particularly that ties in with the notion of, of unit testing, the idea of writing lots of tests that test the, the functionality of individual small components, usually at the function or method level. And then there's a huge amount more of concept, a huge number of more concepts about testing. There are these higher level things.
you know, we talked a bit about this a little while ago. Um, integration testing, testing that things when you bring them together actually behave together as you'd expect. The ideas, you know, again, big ideas, big scale ideas like end to end testing, where you're looking at the process that a user goes through to do a particular task and making sure that it can be done um, coherently. And then various kinds of user testing, testing how users interact with a, with a system. You know, notions from games programming about play testing and this kind of thing. These kinds of scenarios that you can't summarize in the form of, of, a, uh, of, a, of a set of input data and expected behaviors, things to do with how do people actually react when you put them in some front of something. And then specific testing ideas that are do with do with specific parts of a system. So ideas, for example, to do with load testing, performance testing, anything to do with how well a thing reacts, reacts when you're actually doing it. So you, know, you can have something that works perfectly well in theory, but <coughs> you just don't have the, it works functionally perfectly well, it processes the data in the right way. But when you scale it up to a realistic, a realistic scale, it doesn't work because it's putting too much load on the hardware and so on. Ideas about testing for security, ideas about what's sometimes called compatibility testing, the idea of when you've actually got a system when you've actually got a system out there in the world running on lots of different combinations of hardware and software, how well does it work? And that's important in you know, commercial programs and open source programs that are going out there to be used by lots of different users in the home or in the work environment, rather than software that's written for one specific specific place. So there's a huge amount of of stuff in this this area of software testing. Um, I want to concentrate a few minutes now on this, um, probably the rest of the session really, on this unit testing. So we've got an idea that we want to do this kind of test-driven development. We want to incorporating testing into day-to-day -day, um, software development. So what do you need to do in order to do that? Well, the basic unit of object-oriented programming is the class, yeah? And so if you want to test that, you need to in some way set up the environment that the class will run in and then call the methods with some appropriate test data and then compare the output from those test data with expected results. That could be results as in numerical results or you know variable value results more generally, or it could be a, a, a higher level behavior. So for example, you might want to test that an exception is thrown at a particular point, something like that. So there are lots of ways to do this. You could just write your own little fragments of code to do this. You could use these more informal methods printing out statements, running, stepping through things, and observing values. So, but this is all, for this kind of thing, this kind of thing rapidly becomes the sort of thing you don't do, particularly if you want to do this regression testing and keep testing things again and again. This sort of less formal stuff is great for finding specific details of where something's gone wrong. But if you want to do this ongoing automated testing, it's perhaps best to have some kind of tool to do that rather than just writing ad hoc programs to do it. So one example of a tool which we'll, we'll have a look at in one of the classes later in the week is, is JUnit. And this is, a, um, this is a, a tool that's integrated into a lot of these Thing, NetBeans and Eclipse both have this uh, 
uh, built in to some extent and these use different uh, different what the different variants J unit use different uh, methods uh, different techniques to access the uh, the thing the the, the, the the code so as we said earlier we've got ideas about automated testing yeah so Tests are useful if we can run them over and over again. So testing becomes a day-to-day -day behavior. So, um, like I say, there's this book, it's quite an old book now, called Extreme Programming. And the philosophy, which is, you know, is one of the, the books that launched this, this agile methods uh, concept. And, the extreme in extreme programming re referred to taking practices that worked well in software development and seeing if you could, you know, what happens if you do them all the time? What happens if you <coughs> try and make them part of day-to-day -day development? So they take a number of, of practices from software development and say, what if we stop regarding these as really special things and make them... Uh, parts of day-to-day -day development. So this led to ideas about automated testing and the idea that if testing is a good thing, then you should be doing testing all the time. So in particular, you want to keep on testing the stuff that you've done already. So a test that passed yesterday, you make some change to the code and you test that new piece of code and it works fine. But if you were to go back and do the original test, it might fail. So fixing one fault can, you know, sort of, what's the saying, two steps forward, one step back. You know, you, you fix something and that creates a problem elsewhere. So to make this in any way practical, you have to have some kind of automatic testing process. So... You need to have these inputs and the outputs you expect stored in some way. And then, you know, this is what things like JUnit are designed to do. And the same, you know, this leads to the idea of the big red button, you know, the idea that every time you make a change, you can press that test button and that runs all the tests that you've defined for that system. So someone mentioned regression testing that's up on the board, didn't we? You know, so there's a large collection of tests that can be run automatically. So every time there's a change to the software, you run a test. And so you can you can you can become increasingly confident that the system's working. With the usual caveat that um, you know, if you even if you reduce the number of tests that fail to zero, that doesn't prove that the system is working all the time. It just shows that it's only as good as the test data, and even the best test data is incomplete. So we can't have complete confidence, but it does give us this idea of increased confidence that it's working. So... These tools like JUnit support this very much. And I think we always said this, really. You know, you start, you've got the idea of test-driven development. You write tests first, write test code, then production code, and keep this little cycle going of test code and production code. So people have talked about why this is a good thing. It's test-driven development. And some of this is about the stuff we've talked about earlier, about communication and so on, and about ongoing testing. But there's kind of cultural and psychological aspects to this as well within a, within a, a system. There's the fact that if you've got to write tests first, then you actually write the tests. You know, testing is one of these things which, like documentation, you know, everyone nods and, you know, you have these noddy exams about 
software engineering or something and you say documentation is one of the most important parts of software engineering and then you go away and you don't do it, you know. And so, you know, what one part of this thing about test-driven development is that it kind of makes the writing of tests a kind of, you know, part of the culture of, of how you program. You write them first so they actually get done. And then you don't think it's a kind of chore that you do afterwards. And so, you know, you've got this idea of thinking clearly about that unit, that method, or whatever it is that you're testing, and perhaps communicating that. You know, this might be something you're doing by yourself, but as I say, you know, this can become a, about communicating requirements in a, for, a more formal way. So you can build up these, these, these little test cases and rerun them when the code's changed. So people have adopted ideas from engineering, and there's a sort of language that comes from engineering, in particular, this notion of test harnesses. I first, this is one of these things where, where I sort of came across it backwards. I first came across the notion of test harness in software engineering, and I wondered what a test harness really was and where that terminology came from. And, and this is a test harness here. So this picture's quite hard to, to parse. This is a picture off the, the NASA website. And they're testing a plane here. There's a wing there and the tail and so on. But there's all this other stuff here. So what are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to test whether a plane will, will, will be stable when it's flying, when there's vibration and turbulence and so on. And so one way to do this is to, is to run lots of planes up into the sky and, and, uh, and see how they perform up there. But that's dangerous. There's a program on about a plane, do you see that, about plane crash up the sky where they did this, did this test and they actually crashed a plane and it was very complicated because they had to, you know, they had to remote control the plane and everything and it was really complicated and expensive. So, um, you know, this is another way of doing it. You, 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 you define specific things. You say, I want to test for a certain kind of vibration at this point in the wing. You can define those parameters very carefully and then test, test each component, both individually, and then you can run all the tests together. You can get all these things going together. So you've got some notion of integration testing there. So in a sense, what JUnit is about and systems like that is building this kind of test infrastructure for, for software. So JUnit is this framework for writing tests. Um, so it allows you to define and execute tests and so on. And in particular, as we've said already, I think I said most of this as we've gone along, it's um, integrated very closely into a lot of IDEs, so that rather than having to quit your main environment, run a test and go back in, you can define these things and have it uh, running when you want, almost running in the background, almost testing all the time. Um, so there's that integration is important. So there's a lot of terminology here. Um, so there's the idea of a test runner, uh, you know, a software that runs and uh, runs tests and reports the results. There's the the terminology that I think we've seen from the, one or two of these diagrams earlier on, the notion of a test suite, which is a collection of test cases. And a test case is something that tests the response of a particular component to a particular set of inputs. So you, that's the, you know, the bread and butter of testing, is writing these test cases. And, and then you've got this idea of unit testing. So this is all about, about unit testing, about day-to-day -day testing during, during development. And so a unit is the, the smallest piece of code that it makes sense to, to test in, 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 in isolation. And then this idea of, a, a, in general, they call it a test fixture which is an environment in which the tests run. So methods can't be tested in isolation. 
they need some kind of infrastructure. That may be as simple as initiating a class and populating its, its variables, its attributes, or it might be some huge piece of infrastructure. You know, you might need to set up some kind of server, database server in a particular state and get ready to connect to it. So, you know, you've got this whole idea of what you need to set up um, beforehand. And then we've talked a bit about some of these ideas about integration testing and so on. And, you know, that's, that's, that's getting beyond what, what this kind of system can do. This is, as the name suggests, focused on day-to-day -day unit testing of particular components. <coughs> so, what do these things look like? Well, you know, typically these JUnit tests look, have, this, have these aspects of uh, some kind of before and after and some kind of tests that you want to run. So, you've got the idea of this key keyword before, all, all the things in, in uh, JUnit are done with these um, at signs. This is the kind of way that these are, you annotate your code with these, these things. So you annotate the test code with these things. So before is about saying how to set up this uh, test environment, this test fixture. And then after is about what you do afterwards to remove that infrastructure. In this example, it's trivial, but it might be that if you're testing something that involves external components, you want to reset those, their initial, uh, you know, reset those <coughs> to disable connections and so on. And then you've got a number of, of tests that you run. And these tests um, include doing something, so running some kind of things on the on the object you've set up and then making some assertions <coughs> saying that you expect this is probably the best example here if i add that particular piece of data into a table then i'm making the assertion that at the end of the running of this at that point in running the test that that thing holds that if I, if I get the number corresponding to the name Jack, then that number is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's an absolutely trivial example, of course. We've done it and then we've tested it. You know, not, not unimportant, but it's, you know, we would typically expect the behavior that's going on in these methods to be much more sophisticated, to be doing much more processing on the data. But that gives you a, an idea of the overall, the overall process of writing these tests. So when you run this JUnit system, you see J, a particular JUnit um, test suite will have a number of these, these, these tests in, 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 in these um, test classes, and then running a test within that consists of running each of the methods that are annotated with that annotation called test. And then each test runs the things that are annotated with before, before it runs the test, and then it follows it with that after one. And the way that you get your results is through these assert methods. So the assert, the assert methods can be about values, but they can also be about things like exceptions. There's also a before class and after class um, exception. There's before class and after class assertion. Uh, yeah, sorry, my annotation is what I'm looking for. Before class and after class annotation, which is similar to these, which is is if you is just run once before the class and after the class is created. Uh, the test class is created rather than between in that, each test. So, as I say, the you know the bread and butter of this is these assertions, is these things about 
what you require, what you expect of the program. So you can say, I assert it's equal to something. So you can say, I expect, having done this, 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 this method, I expect to get a certain value. You can do similar things for arrays. You can have notions of asserting that something should give a, a null value as assertions that relate to exceptions. So you might have uh, an example of a test like this. So here the expectation is not that a particular is not about a particular value, but it's about expecting to get a particular exception. So here you've got some kind of um, thing about adding members to a database, and you've got the notion of a name, a month, and a year, and you test that when you put a number in that isn't uh, within the range of a month, that that throws an exception to say that the wrong kind of argument's been passed to that method. So you can test to see whether exceptions are thrown when you put in particular uh, data or behaviors. So there's various ways once you define these tests to do this, there's, there's, there's command line things, there are one or two GUI, independent GUI sort of things that, that, that enable you to do this. But the canonical way of using this sort of thing is within an IDE. You define a number of tests as part of the project that you're working on <coughs> in something like NetBeans or Eclipse. And then that, that set of tests is associated with that project, so you can run it uh, as you're doing development. So a few final thoughts on this. So often the amount of test code exceeds the size of the code for small systems, which seems odd. But writing these test codes is often much more straightforward than writing the code itself. Um, by contrast, once com systems become complex, tests can become complex, and that raises a, a complicated issue about how do you test the tests and so on, which is uh, you know, a very difficult issue. You know, how, how do you become saying, is this equal to this, is a very, is a very simple test, but once, once testing becomes more complex, there's a whole, there's a whole complex issue about tests can be wrong as well. So the argument for this is that, you know, we create test code and that eventually, you know, you do this up front and it seems to be taking more time, but that's repaid in reduced development time because you're doing this constant testing, this regression testing. And so the overall time taken is to, um, is reduced. And the idea that creating tests first helps us clarify our ideas about how methods work. So there's a few arguments why this kind of thing's a, a, a valuable part of day-to-day -day software development. So we said there's lots of different kinds of testing. You know, when we talked about your experiences of software development, we had lots of different, different things. And we focused in this, this lecture on routine testing of small parts of code, what people call unit testing, and how that's integrated into the day-to-day -day development cycle, particularly in test-driven development, and particular testing is something you do every time you change uh, the code, so the big red button, the regression testing, all that sort of stuff. So to find out more about JUnit, there's a website, um, and there's some API documentation and so on, and there's a few more readings there which might be useful background material. So that's all I want to say today. There's going to be an exercise on using this in practice. I don't think it's the one for tomorrow, but I think it's the one for later on in the week, and I'll put those up on Moodle SAP. So, um, so should I say tomorrow? Evening tomorrow and Tuesday. I thought, is it Monday? No, it's not Monday, so it's Friday, isn't it? So, <laughs> lost it. So there's a.
the class on Tuesday is, is, is about something else, but then I think there's a class for the Thursday and Friday groups, um, which is about, about this. Okay, thank you very much. No, no, there isn't. I've sh is, there, is there normally a sign-in sheet for the lectures as well as the classes? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. I'll, I'll I'll print one for next week then. Okay. I'll print. Uh, yeah. Don't worry about today, but I'll print one for next week. Thank you.